So the family and I met with Governor Bush, Jeb Bush, and he said, give me some legal footing. And um, I went to various constitutional law firms that I knew. I believe we submitted five different memorandum of law to the governor's office saying, look, the governor has the constitutional authority as the chief law enforcement agent of this state to intervene on behalf of Terry. And he wouldn't do it, would not do it. Well, the legislature of Florida passed a bill, they hammered out a compromise and they passed a bill specifically giving Governor Bush the authority to intervene on Terry's behalf. He signed it into law and he intervened and he ordered uh, some law enforcement division of, of Florida to remove her from the hospice, to take her to a local hospital, and have her feeding tube reinstated. Because she was already in day five or six of them starving her to death the first time in 2003. So she was spared. Thank you, God. They took her back to the hospital. Now, the problem that everyone knew was that this was a hastily crafted law. It was very case specific, and there were a lot of people, um, myself included, that felt that it was not going to pass constitutional muster, that there was going to be problems with this law in court, given the makeup of our judiciary, both in Florida as in the state and in the federal level and that it was going to end up being struck down. That is, in fact, what ultimately happened. The law was struck down. So in, 2000, in early 2005, once it had made its way through the courts, and the court did, in fact, strike down the law. Now, for, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with my history in this, after we prevailed the first time, uh, I think the Philadelphia Inquirer did a huge story on, basically it was Activism 101, how we were able to take the case, uh, this obscure, pr primarily unknown case, and bring it to national prominence in 2003. They credited me, uh, an activist named Phil Sheldon, a friend of mine, a couple other key players, and showed how that we marshaled our troops at that time to bring the case into public, uh, into the public arena, and got substantial media coverage, enough so that the Florida legislature intervened. And we were running all over the place. We were bringing people in and having people lobby and had people kneeling uh, at, the, at the state capitol. It was, it was quite an intense, it was quite an intense battle. And I believed with all my heart that she deserved to live and did not deserve to be starved to death. Okay? If you have a sick puppy and you drove its chain into the ground and just let it sit there and dehydrate and die, you'd be arrested for animal abuse. It would just enrage people. So we fought and we prevailed. And the dad, Bob Schindler, uh, gave a statement to the press and for us to use it and said, if it wasn't for Randall Terry, my daughter would be dead. So I, I was heavily invested. Fast forward almost two years later, and the law had been struck down, and Bob Schindler and, and his son Bobby contacted Gary and I again, Gary McCullough, and came to us and said, we'd like to hire you to recall the troops, to bring in the cavalry. Now, now the first time we did this, we, we just did it for free. I mean, they, I, didn't, I don't do this for the money. And I would have done it the second time for free. But they offered to pay us, so they gave us a, a nominal sum of money. I was thankful for it, had to support our ministry, had to support our family. And again, we would have done it for free, happily, because my heart was in it. Um, but they wanted us. They wanted us to do this because Bob Schindler knew that I had what some people call the juice, and that Gary and I as a team and the others that we could bring in that we would execute this properly. So we went back down. I took my family, 
my wife, small children. We called upon friends and troops all over the country. <clears throat> and it was around the time of Easter in 2005. John Paul II was very ill at that time and was watching the events unfold on his television in his room in the final days of his life. I've got to take a break. It's, it's difficult for me to even go back there and to relive it. Um, it, was, it was very gut-wrenching to watch her being starved to death. And one of the reports I read said that people who are dehydrated die a peaceful death. What a lie. Witnesses that were, had access to them were coming and going saying that she was feverish, she was convulsing. And at one point she looked at one person and, and like looked at the person and looked at the water with her eyes, you know, frantically saying, why, just please pour some of this into my mouth. I'm going to take a break. And again, bringing this back around to why I don't trust Jeb Bush and why I really don't like him. And I'll be right back. <clears throat> Do you want to get America out of the hands of wicked and unjust men and women who are destroying the republic before our eyes and put leadership back into the hands of righteous men and women so that we don't die as a nation? Well, you're talking about social revolution and there are rules in social revolution. We can look at the victorious social revolutions of the past, such as the end of slavery, the end of child labor, women's voting rights, the end of segregation, and so much more, and learn from their victories. Look at their actions, their images, their rhetoric, their sacrifices, and their final fruit. We will send you this series that originally cost $129, seven books for students, one teacher's guide, if you'll give a gift of any size and just pay for shipping and handling. Take advantage of it today.